love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord indeed gives what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Let us pray. Living and loving Lord, we gather together across time and space to worship you, united by the words we read, united by our love for you. We celebrate your awesome majesty, your holiness and your amazing love. We acknowledge you as Lord of our lives. We sing your praise and we bless your name. Living Lord, we give thanks for all that you have done in our lives and pray that we will continue to be open to your work in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. I'm Patrick. I'm a minister in the Methodist Church in the north and northwest of Bristol and into South Gloucestershire. And as we meet together, whether you're local to my usual area of ministry or from further afield, the welcome is the same. As together we open our hearts and minds to God, whose love knows no bounds. As Bible Month continues, and we continue to engage with the story of Ruth, our written devotions this week have been provided by John Hopper, and there's a link, as usual, to those below. But I'd like to say thank you to John for those, and equally to the work he puts in week by week to produce our printed notice and news sheet. Our service will conclude today with another of Charles Wesley's well-known hymns, Love Divine. And thanks are due to the group of choir members from St. Peter's in Pilning for the work and the preparation they put into that. So let's hear now the continuing story of Ruth, which Danica and Efwa will read for us, using the Bibles they were given almost a year ago now when they were confirmed and received into the membership of our church. It so happened that Naomi had a relative by marriage, a man prominent and rich, connected with Eli Melech's family. His name was Boaz. One day, Ruth, the Moabite foreigner, said to Naomi, I'm going to work. I'm going out to glean among the sheaves, following after some harvester who will treat me kindly. Naomi said, Go ahead, dear daughter. And so she set out. She went and started gleaning in a field, following in the wake of the harvesters. Eventually, she, hen she ended up in the part of the field owned by Boaz, her father-in-law, Eli Melech's relative. A little later, Boaz came out from Bethlehem, greeting his harvesters. God be with you, they replied, and God bless you. Boaz asked his young servant, who was foreman over the farmhands, who is this young woman? Where does she come from? The foreman said, Why, that's the Moabite girl, the one who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. She asked permission. Let me glean, she said, and gather among the sheaves following after your harvesters. She, she's been at it steady ever since, from early morning until now, without so much as a break. Then Boaz replied to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, from now on, don't go to any other field to glean. Stay right here in this one, and stay close to my young women. Watch where they are harvesting and follow them, and don't worry about a thing. I've given orders to my servants not to harass you. When you get thirsty, feel free to go and drink from the water buckets that the servants have filled. She dropped to her knees, then bowed her face to the ground. How does this happen that you should pick me out and treat me so kindly, me, a foreigner? Continuing from Ruth chapter 2, verses 11 to 23. Boaz answered her, I've heard all about you, heard about the way you treated your mother-in-law after the death of her husband, and how you left your father and mother and the land of your birth and have come to live among a bunch of total strangers. God reward you well for what you've done, and with a generous bonus, besides from God, to whom you've come seeking protection under his wings. She said, Oh, sir, such kindness, such grace, I don't deserve it. 
You've touched my heart, treated me like one of your own, and I don't even belong here. At the lunch break, Boaz said to her, come over here, eat some bread, dip it in the wine. So she joined the harvesters. Boaz passed the roasted grain to her. She ate her fill and even had some leftover. When she got up to go back to work, Boaz ordered his servants, let her glean where there's still plenty of grain on the, on the ground. Make it easy for her. Better yet, pour some of the good stuff and leave it for her to glean. Give her special treatment. Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. When she threshed out what she'd gathered, she ended up with nearly a full stack of barley. She gathered up her gleanings, went back to town and showed her mother-in-law the results of her day's work. She also gave her leftovers from her lunch. Naomi asked her, so where did you glean today? Whose field? God bless whoever it took such good care of you. Ruth told her mother-in-law, the man who I worked with today, his name is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, why, God bless that man. God hasn't quite walked out on us yet. He still loves us in bad times as well as good. Naomi went on, that man, Ruth, is one of our circle of covenant redeemers, a close relative of ours. Ruth, the Moabite, said, well, listen to this. He also told me, stick with my workers until my harvesting is finished. Naomi said to Ruth, that's wonderful, dear daughter, do that. You'll be safe in the company of his young woman. No danger now of being raped in some stranger's field. So Ruth did it. She stuck close to Boaz's young woman, gleaning in the fields daily until both the barley and wheat harvesting were finished. And she continued living with her mother-in-law. Last week, I encouraged you to read the beginning of Ruth's story for yourself and to draw your own conclusions and reflections. As I asked you to do that, it's only fair, I think, for me to share just a couple of my own as I did the same. Firstly, what struck me was the overall sense of the first chapter, starting with hunger and ending with harvest. And then secondly, how the relationship between Naomi and Ruth is not just strengthened by the challenging circumstances they find themselves in. That relationship begins to be forged in a new and different way, expressed in the deep faith they have in each other and in God. This image by the contemporary artist Sandy Freckleton Gagan is called Whither Thou Goest and for me it captures the essence of that relationship. On the left we see Ruth, the younger woman, using her cape to shelter and protect the elder Naomi against the harsh weather, offering as well a supportive arm around her. On the right we see Naomi, pictured with wisdom and experience expressed in her greying hair. And it's Naomi who is leading the way with the staff in her hand. So their journey is not about one or the other. The two companions are travelling with each other, stronger than they would have been had they set off alone. And so, for me, the opening chapter is one of contrasts. And in their struggles amidst the background of famine, when the bread basket is empty, they are walking together walking together in faith with each other and with God, in a God who brings hope and transformation for them and for those around them. Following the events in Bristol last weekend, in particular on Sunday afternoon, I wondered for a moment in light of the continuing reactions to those, whether I should look at another passage rather than us continue to read through Ruth. But as we journey into chapter two, I think there's plenty that speaks to our contemporary experience as well. As Ruth appears in chapter two, there's an assumption about her lowly status. In verse five, it's Boaz who asks, who is this young woman? Where did she come from? Questioning her very status. Later on in verses nine and 22, we hear about the risk of her being molested as she works, treated as an item of property rather than as a person. Extending that into our contemporary experience for a moment, a few months ago our minds were focused on the Me Too movement 
which highlighted the prevalence of abusive behaviour towards women. We don't need to look too far to hear that women continue to suffer such abuse and be such behaviour. In the last few days, we've heard that J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, has suffered sexual and domestic abuse in the past. And whilst there are many things to be thankful for during this period of lockdown in our neighbourhood and in our family lives, we have heard of evidence of an increase in domestic abuse. And so as we turn once more to Ruth on top of the treatment she might receive because of her gender, Ruth as a foreign woman, a migrant worker, one without status, is left even without the basic of dignity. During Bible Month, as we're doing our best to engage with this story, in order to understand what God is saying to us, one thing I've been doing alongside it is to listen and watch to the programme A House Through Time on the BBC. As you know, if you've watched that, that's focused on a property in Bristol at the moment. And as much as the story is gripping, it's also a salutary reminder about the impact that the slave trade had on those who were transported across the world, losing all status, losing all dignity, just referred to by the number or even just part of the crowd. And some of them, of course, not losing just their dignity and status but indeed losing their lives too. And in the story of Ruth, the story of hope begins with Ruth herself, because it's Ruth who acts with respect. It's Ruth who affords dignity to herself and those she's working with by joining in wholeheartedly with the collective workload. As the foreman says to Boaz, she's been at it steady from early morning until now without so much as a break. As we strive to work out the call to be neighbours, to love our neighbours as we love ourselves, let's take heart from Ruth's example, finding dignity for herself in her own actions. And once she's done that, Ruth then turns to her neighbour. In this case, her companion, the vulnerable and depressed Naomi the one who has taken the name Mara, which means bitter, and offers to her the results of her labour and the rest of her lunch. And in response, Naomi talks not of bitterness, but of blessing. So these faithful actions of Ruth and of Boaz, who has noticed her and offered protection and provision for her, it's these actions which restore Naomi's trust in God. So in response to this story, as we continue to engage with it, what acts of faithfulness, what acts of protection and provision, what compassion might we share in the days and weeks ahead? We might well start in faithful prayer, but as Pope Francis reminds us, you pray for the hungry and then you feed them. This is how prayer works. So drawing on Ruth's example, we might pray with people denied human rights, with all denied dignity and subjected to abuse, and cry for justice for them. We might pray for refugees, for all those who seek asylum, for those who are migrant workers in our country, and show them welcome, care and concern. We might remember before God those who are hungry, but then offer support in some way to our food banks and to others providing help for them through food. And let us pray for all those like Naomi, who have lost hope and become embittered, and find ways to connect with them and channel God's grace and love and hope. Amen. And as we turn to prayer, we're going to begin with a prayer inviting us each to offer ourselves in an act of spiritual communion, a reminder of the offering that Ruth made, but also of the hope that we all bring into the communities of which we are a part. So let us pray. 
Jesus, my brother, who brought divine life out of human death. You are meeting me here and now in this place, in this moment. I pause to remember that the one thing I desire above all others is for you to be with me. Though I cannot receive you in bread and wine today, come into my heart and show me you are already there within me by your love lighting my darkness from within. Open my eyes to your sacred presence in each thing you have created and in every moment you give. And as each of your followers does their part where they are, may we all grow together in love and in richer, fuller communion. Make us one with you and with all who love you in every time and place. Help us to feel and to know that we are united as members of your body. With all your people, we seek to share your risen life, which renews all creation. And we offer ourselves to you in service as an act of spiritual worship. And as we offer ourselves, so we offer our prayers for others. We pray justice for the falsely accused, freedom for the wrongly imprisoned, healing for the tortured or abused, care for the orphan or widow, concern for the refugee and dispossessed, provision for the hungry and homeless. May we weep as you weep, love as you love, and not be afraid to be angry for the sake of your children, wherever they might be. In our helplessness we ask that you, Lord, will enfold them in your love. And we join these and all our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, using a version of our own choice. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And before we say our prayer of blessing, can I just highlight this week's Methodist podcast, a link to which is below the video. In it, there is some more information and comment and reflection about John Wesley and the early moves to abolish slavery in the 18th century, and also some updates on contemporary matters of social justice. And I encourage you just to take the time to listen to the podcast and reflect upon it for yourself. And may God give us the faithfulness of Ruth, the practical care of Boaz, and the compassion of our Lord Jesus. And may we all know the blessing of God, star maker, pain bearer and life giver, today and always. Amen.